detoxification technique. You can achieve 100% success. So talking about the diet now, so what foods do we avoid? We avoid all the foods which are difficult to digest, which Sally outlined beautifully. Plant foods are difficult to digest. Vegetarians, can you hear that? Plant foods damage our gut. And grains and lentils are number one. Grains and leguminous uh, foods are the number one. They are full of substances which damage the gut. These children and adults already have got damaged gut. They cannot handle these things. They cannot digest them in any shape or form. So they have to be removed for long enough time for those enterocytes to rebuild new layers in the gut, to repair themselves, to restore the gut. On average, it takes a couple of years. The younger the child, the quicker they recover. Adults take longer than children, in general. But it is the good thing about this diet that you don't have to stick to it for the rest of your life. You stick to it for a period of time until the gut is healed, and then you can gradually start introducing other foods and start eating in a more versatile way. But of course, as you went through this diet, majority of people find that they cannot go back to their processed and junk food diet that they used to eat before. So all grains have to be removed, all grains and anything made out of them, and that's wheat, rice, rye, oats, millet, quinoa, tapioca, couscous, amaranth, the lot. All starchy vegetables, potato family, has to be out, parsnips have to be out, sugar and all commercial sweetness. Our commercial powers keep coming up with new commercial sweetness, with new artificial sweetness. I keep getting um, phone calls and emails from people all the time. Well, what do you think about this new sweetener? What about this and what about xylitol? What about... Don't trust any of them. Do not touch any of them. Nature has provided us with wonderful sweetness, which are good for us. Milk, sugar, lactose has to be removed. Starchy beans, including soy. There's only one variety of beans that is allowed, and that's only later on in the diet, because even those beans contain lectins and phytates and other substances which are very hard for GAP's gut to handle. All processed foods naturally have to be out, and all food additives. In this diet, everything the child or the adult eats has to be cooked at home from fresh, from fresh ingredients. No takeaways, no eating out, because you cannot guarantee what's been put in that food and how that food has been cooked. Recommended foods, what do we actually eat? All meats cooked from fresh or frozen. All fish cooked from fresh or frozen. Organ meats are very important. Once a week, at least, liver has to be eaten. I give a lot of recipes to the parents how to in include liver on a daily basis into the child's diet. I recommend that you cook a whole liver with, with other meats, make a beautiful meat stock, make a beautiful bouillon from it, and then you grind it with some bouillon in your food processor into a fine slop, fill up an ice cube tray, freeze it, and then add an ice cube into a meal every day into your child's meal. That's one of the easy coping strategies that a lot of parents do for liver. But liver is not optional for these children. They have to have it on a daily basis or in small amounts every day or a good full liver meal once a week. Good quality eggs, non-starch vegetables, and that means all vegetables are allowed, apart from potato, exotic potatoes, and parsnips. So that's a very large choice of vegetables. All ripe fruit, fruit has to be ripe, because unripe fruit is full of starches, which are hard to digest. As the fruit ripens, the starches get converted, broken down into monosugars, and the fruit is much easier to digest. That is why when you buy tropical fruits and other fruits, Majority of commercially available fruit in supermarkets is, is unripe. So it has to be bought and kept in a warm place to ripen, if it will ripen. Some fruit doesn't ripen at all, so you have to cook it. Nuts and seeds are an important part of the diet. Fermented dairy. When we ferment milk, we add fermenting bacteria. Bacteria like eating sugars, so they immediately eat lactose. So well-fermented dairy products are lactose-free. There's your lactose-free dairy products. Apart from that, what happens? This bacteria pre-digest the proteins and the sugars and other substances in milk. So well-fermented dairy products are pre-digested. They're very easy for a damaged digestive tract to handle. That is why they're included into this diet. However, there is a small percent of patients who are allergic to dairy. So with those patients, we have to follow a particular protocol, which I describe in my book on page, page 95. Cold extracted honey 
is the sweetener load. Natural fats. That's a very, very important part of the diet. As Sally already told you, fevers, detoxification, exertion, any vigorous activity the body has to do, consumes vitamin A and vitamin D and vitamin K and many other nutrients at an alarming rate. These children, as they detoxify on the program, they will be consuming huge amounts of vitamin A. Nobody has ever measured it. We don't know what the levels should be, and we would never know. But if we provide ample amounts of these vitamins in our food form, then if we provide too much, the body would know how to deal with it. Because excessive amounts of these vitamins, when it comes in a food form, the body knows what to deal with it. It's not going to cause any harm. But if you provide supplements of those vitamins, then you can overdose quite easily. That is why I recommend these uh, this, uh, substances only in a food form. That is why I recommend liver, and I recommend egg yolks, and I recommend cream, and butter, and animal fats. As Sally outlined very beautifully to you, the most important fats for us humans to consume are animal fats. This is something that majority of people find it very difficult to get their mind around. Because we grew up in a society of fat phobia and cholesterol phobia. People who are in their 20s and 30s now have grown up from this age, seeing advertisements on TV, which are fat-free and low-fat and protects your heart and anti-cholesterol and low cholesterol. So they grew up thoroughly brainwashed, these people. They're afraid of animal fats. They're afraid of cholesterol. They're afraid of these sort of things. But if you look at the structure of the human body, at the structure of human cells, of membranes and cell walls, about half of the fats that we made from are saturated. Another 30% are, are monounsaturated, such as oleic fatty acid. And only the rest of it are various varieties of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So if we do need polyunsaturates, and I'm sure all of you heard about the fish oils and the flax oil and hemp oil and many, many other oils, they've been promoted very vigorously by the health movements in the last few years. These oils, these fatty acids, need to be consumed in tiny amounts. And if you're on a good diet, you will get them in food. You don't need to supplement them. What you do need in huge amounts, in large amounts, are animal fats. So eat your crackling on your pork, and eat your fat on your lamb chops, and eat the fatter cuts of beef, and eat the egg yolks, and eat tons of butter. You cannot overload on butter. Particularly if you eat porridge in the morning. In Russia, we've got a saying, you cannot spoil the porridge with butter. So if you have a little bit of porridge and lots of butter, it will be better. <laughs> better for you. So all the animal fats need to be the main fats that humans should consume. Not the hemp oil, not the flaxseed oil, not the sunflower oil, not the fish oil, and not all the other polyunsaturated oils. If you're eating raw vegetables, if you're eating raw fruit, if you're eating nuts, particularly uncooked nuts, you will get plenty of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. You don't need to supplement them. You don't need any extra. Coconut oil and palm oil are very, very good. They're largely saturated, but their value also is in specific fatty acids which are antimicrobial, antiviral, and anti-candida, antifungal. So coconut oil can be used as an antifungal um, supplement. And it also tastes nice. You can eat it as it is. And a lot of people who have sugar cravings find that if they have a couple of tablespoons of coconut oil, when they have a sugar craving, the craving goes away. It's more difficult to eat uh, pork fat that way, isn't it, or goose fat? But the coconut oil, you can. Obviously, avoid all fats and fat replacements that the food industry is trying to convince us to eat. This is a book that I've written in response to my patients. Going back to the previous slide, when I would start talking about this subject, the natural question that everybody would immediately ask me, am I going to die from a heart attack from your diet? What about my heart? What about my cholesterol? Uh, what about, uh, I had a test of cholesterol a couple of weeks ago and it was high. Can I eat all these animal fats? And having explained to a hundredth patient that natural cholesterol and natural fats have nothing to do with heart disease, in fact, they prevent it, I thought I'd better write a book about it. And this book was the result. 
um, of these recommendations on the diet. The book is available here. So for any of you who are interested to know what fats actually cause the heart disease, what these fats do in the body, what kind of cholesterol there are, and what kind of cholesterol we should be avoiding and which not, please read the book. Supplementation is an important part of the program. I do not believe in eating a lot of supplements. I believe that we need to get our nutrition from food, not from pills. This is a minimum list of supplements that I give to my patients. I give them absolute minimum, three supplements, and they're all foods. They're not really supplements. One, an effective probiotic. Another one, cod liver oil, which will provide vitamin A and vitamin D, and some varieties provide vitamin E and even K in little amounts, and essential fatty acids. Because there is a lot of research to show that fish oils in particular help in dyslexia, dyspraxia, and other conditions. One condition I would warn not to give uh, essential fatty acids in, it is epilepsy. Evening primrose oil, sometimes cod liver oil, and fish oil can trigger epileptic fits. We don't know why, whether some sort of detox goes on, or restructuring in the brain goes on, or whether something toxic going on, but these people uh, should not take these oils. So for them, just an effective probiotic and a little amount of cod liver oil is enough. I would not give them any other supplements until the seizures are well under control. Multivitamin mineral amino acid supplement is optional. I give it to uh, a small percentage of people when we've got some niggling problems and we're not quite dealing with them. So the initial program to tackle the problem is the diet, the probiotic, and cod liver oil and fish oil. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Digestive enzymes, again, are optional. A lot of people with abnormal gut flora cannot produce enough stomach acid because toxins which are produced in the gut impair stomach acid uh, production. So a lot of them benefit, particularly others benefit, from taking HCL and pepsin to start with, or betaine HCL. And some people find it helpful to take pancreatic enzymes at the end of their meal. However, the majority of people don't notice anything particular happening with these enzymes, so for them it isn't uh, essential. Detoxification is an important part of the program, and I believe in natural detoxification. Juicing is a time-honored and time-proven method of removing all sorts of toxins from the body without any side effects. Baths with Epsom salt, sea salt, cider vinegar, and toxins have to be avoided. Avoiding toxin exposure is a very important part of the treatment. I've got a whole chapter on it in my book. This is the book. I've got a couple of uh, examples of patients, but I think we've run out of time. One minute, so we'll sail through it quickly. <laughs> this little boy, who is nine years old now, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, and autism at once in his second year of life, poor chap. He was put on insulin injections at 15 months. Autistic development started from 18 months of age. He was non-verbal, dyspraxic, diarrhea with undigested food, used to be severely constipated, bloating, reflux, finicky eater, malnourished, pale. He had eczema, allergies, poor sleep. He was not potty trained and diagnosed as a celiac. We started GAPS program in May 02, at the age of three and a half. In six months, he had normal stools, eczema has cleared, he had much better feeding habits. He put weight on, he was not pale anymore, and he had a better sleep. In a year, he had great improvements in language development and social skills, got potty trained. In a year and a half at mainstream school, and had many friends, autism and dyspraxia were almost undetectable. The daily dose of insulin was halved. And now, there are no traces of autism or dyspraxia, school champion in karate, insulin injections only occasionally at a low dose. So his diabetes type 1 also pretty much gone. This child, Leandro, he had idiopathic generalized epilepsy and Asperger's syndrome, had normal development till the age of 2, was well, very bright, Italian family, had colic and was prone to constipation and had lots of colds. Rancho became fussy with food, hyperactive, limited his diet, got abnormal stools and became malnourished. At three and a half, after fever, got absences, by four gram mal epilepsic seizures and absences 10, 15 times a day. So these poor parents lived in fear all the time, watching this child like a hawk. He regressed in language and learning ability. 
he got obsession, self-stimulation, he became hyperactive, and he was taking about five different anti-epileptic medications, and the seizures were not controlled. Medication for epilepsy, sodium valproate, was uh, the one that was left eventually. Poor control of seizures, became aggressive, unable to learn, and personality changed. At seven, he started GAPS nutritional protocol. In three months, he was better physically, but the parents felt that medication particularly sodium valproate. From the beginning of the program, they removed other medication. They just left the sodium valproate. Was causing the seizures and interfering with the learning ability. So they started reducing the dose under supervision, of course. In nine months, they reduced the dose to 250 milligram. He had no gram mal at that stage, one for mild absences a day. He was thriving at mainstream school, greatly improved language and learning, better social skills, had friends, stools were normal, and good eating habits. In 20 months, he was off all medication. He had occasionally very mild absence, physically was healthy, not hyperactive anymore, normal behavior, social skills. Academically, he was two years behind. Then the family moved to South Africa, and I lost contact with them. But at that stage, the absences that the child had were very occasional, and they were so mild that people who didn't know him wouldn't notice anything. It's only parents who knew the whole history would notice that he was having an absence. But otherwise, he had uh, these very, very mild absences that nobody could identify. These are my contact details and the website. Thank you very much for listening.